<clears throat> well, most of you will know that, you know, I've been supervising clergy for about 40 years, and I've never known a clergy person who got out of bed one morning thinking, I know what I'll do. I'll just become a jerk. Like, that sounds good. Yeah, I think I'll just start to bully my staff and alienate my vestry and power up over my volunteers. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to do life. I don't, I don't know anybody who's, who's ever got out of bed one morning and decided to do that. Um, but there is, on the other hand, a clear biblical vision for the posture of church leadership. So I think of Jeremiah 15. Remember when Jeremiah said, I'll give you shepherds after my own heart. Now, just think all that's what's caught up in Jeremiah speaking for the Trinitarian God and saying, I will give leaders to Israel who are after my own heart. Or you all know that text probably in 1 Peter 5, 2. I love the way Gene gets it in the message where he says, here's my real concern for you, that you care for God's flock with all the diligence of a shepherd, not because you have to, because you, but because you want to please God, not calculating what you can get out of it, but acting spontaneously, not bossily telling other people what to do, but tenderly showing them the way. So there's like an ethic is all I'm saying throughout all of our scriptures. There's an ethic about how God has pictured the leaders of the people of God construed as Israel or the reconstituted Israel, the church, however one might construe the people of God, there's an ethic in there that, that comes out throughout, um, throughout all the Bible, um, that even when churches and church staffs and vestries and other people, uh, other you know, stakeholders in a church, even when they get a little sideways and there's relational tension, maybe even people begin to feel maybe even like enemies. Um, you know, Paul said to Timothy that even your opponents must be gently instructed. So that leadership picture that we find in the scriptures, though, it does have a reciprocal nature to it. Um, for instance, think of Hebrews 13, 17, uh, where the writer says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work might be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to anybody in the church. And so... I only point that out to point out the sort of reciprocal, genuine, relational um, um, uh, vibe that I think the scriptures have in mind, um, such that leaders behave in ways in which trust is genuinely given, and followers, you know, follow in a way in which they know that they're being trusted and heard, et cetera, as well. So my desires for bringing Chuck together with us all and uh, bringing Chuck into our community today. Um, actually, I think some of you, though Chuck and I have known each other just barely over the years, I think it was actually some of you who alerted me to his most recent work on narcissism and spiritual abuse. And um, it, Chuck just struck me as a, a really trusted, you know, valuable voice that we could bring into this. So my desire is simply for the next hour, hour and a half are, and this is what I've asked Chuck to help us do, is that one, we would come to see clearly what spiritual abuse is. Um, because again, I've got enough experience working in churches and with staffs and vestries and others that it's not even clear to most people what it actually is. Like, is there, is there a spectrum of, let's call it leadership um, malfunction, malpractice that crosses some line on that spectrum and becomes abuse? I'm, I'm, um, I'm asking Chuck to help us see that. I'm hoping that C4SO clergy would therefore learn not to act spiritually abusive. Um, thirdly, that we would be able to recognize spiritual abuse in those who we supervise or work with. And that lastly, we would create corporate cultures in which spiritual abuse could be safely uh, reported. So Chuck, I'm so glad you exist. I'm always glad when God gives gifts to others and we can borrow those gifts and borrow somebody else's mind like yours own. So this is all tricky, Chuck. Uh, help us out here. Uh -huh. Thank you, Todd. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You all can tell me if I am 
doing this in a way that allows you to see my screen. And if it's helpful, let's see, play from the start. Can you see that? Yes, we can, Chuck. And by the way, I forgot to say, Chuck, could you just take a moment to just introduce yourself, yeah. especially yeah. in the sense of how you got to thinking about this important topic? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, thanks, Todd. I, uh, like Todd said, we don't know each other well. I got to hear Todd speak uh, years ago as a part of um, the city classes of the Reformed Church in America. Um, I actually flirted with Anglicanism before I found myself uh, as a part of the Reformed Church in America. Uh, Todd had come out to speak on, on something at that time, and uh, we shook hands. And but, but I do see some familiar faces and have some friends in the mix here and uh, love the work of C4SO. So it's a privilege to do this. Um, at the outset, I want to say, everyone, I, I'm a seminary professor now. In fact, you just mentioned Gene Peterson, Todd, uh, Eugene Peterson. The Eugene Peterson Center exists at Western Theological Seminary now where I teach, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I was a pastor for a long time. And I say that because as a pastor in, in Orlando and in San Francisco, uh, I, I was a pastor of spiritual formation. I planted a church within a church back in the day. I started two church-based counseling centers. In other words, I, I, don't, I don't stand outside the church to critique clergy, if that makes sense. Um, I, I have a heart for clergy. I have a heart for the church. And I think we find ourselves dealing with some really important uh, questions. And that's why I'm, I'm here to help. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've been involved in any number of ecclesial environments, denominations, seminaries, and uh, what I can tell you is sin is sin. Whether you're in a denomination, non-denominational context, uh, whatever sort of theological tradition you find yourself in, we find spiritual abuse in the church. And so I'm naming what has become a kind of epidemic within the church, and the reality is is that we're, we're living in anxious times. Uh, we'll just start with some of the headlines. You can see them right there. Uh, I think we're living in one of the most challenging seasons to serve as a member of the clergy, at least in our short history in the North American church. And well, there should be a sense that the headlines ought to feature self-sacrificial love and extraordinary generosity, uh, which, which would be a witness to the cruciform God uh, too often and Recent years and recent decades, we've seen stories of the abuse of power, the manipulation of trust, the elevation of charisma over character. Uh, um, and I, you all have seen it in the pews as well, people leaving the church, uh, people declaring themselves ex-evangelicals, in some cases ex-Christians. Um, sometimes there are folks who mysteriously disappear from the pews and ghost you at other times there are those who loudly depart. And I think at times like this, it's easy to point the finger in judgment to the, loud, the louder and more critical voices out there. But we've got to ask ourselves, what can we learn from this? Uh, what are we missing? How are we being called to grow in Christ's likeness and the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, uh, amidst stories of bullying and coercion, manipulation, entitlement, abuse, self-aggrandizement, and more. So the question is, what is the way of Jesus for us? Uh, just a bit on clergy trust. You see that first slide on the left, and you'll notice that from about 1985 to about 2001, there wasn't a very significant decline in clergy trust, 67%, um, 64% in 2001. And then we see this precipitous dip uh, with a few elevations along the way. That only goes to 2016. What we know is that that, that, that goes down from there. And, and the reality is, is that 48% of those identifying as Christians reported that clergy are honest and have high eth ethical standards. So less than 50% report that we are trustworthy. Only 25% of non-Christians would report that clergy are trustworthy. Um, in this particular survey out of CT, we were rated just above funeral directors. Uh, actually, the highest trust was for those, those folks in the medical field. And I'm kind of wondering now, post-COVID, if their numbers will drop. And so there's been this steady 
uh, drop in the level of trust uh, since 2009, down from a high of 67% in 1985. Uh, we are now seen as less trustworthy than judges, daycare providers, pharmacists, medical doctors, grade school teachers. Uh, John Fee is a church historian who some of you may know. John Fee says, I think we're living in an era when expertise and authority are under attack in a variety of areas, whether it be religion, politics, or academic life. He says, our society's distrust of clergy may be part of the general distrust of authority that comes with certain forms of populism. And um, well, I think John is right. I think he's onto something. I actually think there are a confluence of factors. I mean, I, I was hearing about uh, the, the growing distrust of authority back in the mid 1990s when I was in seminary with the rise of postmodernism. I, yeah, I think we're seeing some of that. But what I'll say in just a moment is that this issue of spiritual abuse is not a new issue. Just to emphasize this a little bit more, there's a Bournemouth University study commissioned on behalf of the Church's Child Protection Advisory Service, which is a British safeguarding charity. They received 1,591 responses from Christians, 1,000 of two of whom said that they had personally experienced spiritual abuse. That's astounding. Uh, Dr. Lisa Oakley has become an expert in this area. Her IVP book is called Escaping the Maze of Spiritual Abuse. And she breaks down subcategories of spiritual abuse. She talks about those who felt shamed in their current church, 17%, but 49% of those reported shaming, being shamed in a previous church. Those reported being manipulated, 70%. Those who experienced scripture being used for controlling purposes, 45%. And those who reported being damaged as a result, 74%. Those are, those are astounding statistics, but if you know anything about these kinds of stats or stats on domestic abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse, uh, we always see that the numbers are higher than what we thought. Um, but maybe a little bit of hopeful news, Dr. Michael Langen of the Spiritual Safe Haven Network noted that while there are likely larger numbers of spiritual abuse survivors in our churches than we realize, his research finds that many want the church to be a safe and welcoming place and believe that educating clergy and congregations is an important pathway to increasing safe and ecclesial contexts. So in other words, what Michael Langhorn is saying is that what you're doing today is really, really important. Uh, and so there's some value in us learning about, well, what is spiritual abuse? How does it impact us? What are the manifestations of it? What is the trauma that results? All those kinds of things are things that we will talk about today. Um, I'll say this, uh, in my own work, in my own research on narcissism and abuse in the church, uh, there, there are questions around whether or not we see this in non-denominational contexts more than denominational contexts. And what I'd say is that um, they're equally implicated, e even in contexts where there are clear structures and polity uh, we see institutes uh, or instances of sexual abuse. We saw this in the Catholic Church, uh, sexual abuse scandal. We see it particularly in church planting contexts within historic denominations. So the appearance of accountability does not always mean that abuse does not occur. In other words, good ecclesiology and good polity do not always safeguard against abuse. And we'll talk, that, talk about that a little bit more when we talk about abusive systems. I say this isn't a new problem uh, because this is what Ezekiel had to say so very long ago. He said, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Now, just, just a few reflections about this. Whenever a prophet says, woe, uh, W-O-E, uh, I, I always hear, woe, W-H-O-A. Um, I feel it in my being. I feel the gravity of it. 
I think back to my own ordination day over 20 years ago, I feel the weight of preaching. I, I feel the weight of presiding at the table. I feel the weight of pastoral care. I want you to also notice that this passage is not an indictment on needy victims or on consumer congregations or challenging parishioners. Uh, someone said to me recently, it just seems like parishioners are complaining more than they used to, running to social media to air their dirty laundry. Uh, Ezekiel is not merely blowing off some steam on Twitter. Uh, this is a word for rectors and reverends. It's a word for priests and pastors. He says, you do not take care of the flock. And, and this is fleshed out in a direct word about the most vulnerable, the weak, the sick, the injured, the strays the lost. They are the ones who are exploited. They're the ones who are used as resources for the shepherds. And, and I'll admit to you, I've sat in on staff meetings on Monday mornings, you know, Monday mornings when you get the, you get the handful of emails from people after a Sunday about all the things that you did wrong and the songs you didn't sing and the, the improper exegesis, all the stuff. We, I've sat in those kinds of staff meetings where we've pointed the finger at frustrating parishioners. I've complained, I've scapegoated, I've blamed. But the word here is a word for those who have power, the one called, the one anointed, the one ordained, um, the one whose place it is to lead through cruciform love. And the woe, the W-O-E, woe is this. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. We have ruled them harshly and brutally. If we, were on a, if we were on a retreat together, I'd ask you to step away at this point and take about 30 minutes. Just simply sit with that statement. How have I ruled harshly and brutally? Uh, spiritual abuse is fundamentally about power and authority. How we as clergy inhabit and steward our roles and relationships with those entrusted to our care. Again, Ezekiel prompts us to ask, have we ruled them harshly and brutally? And the reality is we have power. Uh, power isn't in and of itself bad. It's a gift. It's bestowed to human beings as, as image bearers and ambassadors and culture creators and city builders. In Genesis 1 and 2, we know that priests are specially anointed for a particular role to foster wholeness and holiness in God's people, to bear witness to God and to the things of God. So so spiritual abuse is about power and authority and how we wield that power and authority. So I like to ask the question, is the problem power? Is the problem authority? Let's see if I can switch to my next slide here. There we go. And the answer, I think, is no. <laughs> this is what Andy Crouch says. He says, remove power and you cut off life. The possibility of creating something new and better in this rich and recalcitrant world. Life is power. Power is life, and flourishing power leads to flourishing life. Of course, like life itself, power is nothing, worse than nothing, without love. But love without power is less than it was meant to be. Love without the capacity to make something of the world, without the ability to respond and make room for the beloved's flourishing, is frustrated love. This is why the love that is the heartbeat of the Christian story the Father's love for the Son and through the Son for the world is not simply a sentimental feeling or a distant ethereal theological truth, but has been signed and sealed by the most audacious act of true power in the history of the world, the resurrection of the Son from the dead. Power at its best is resurrection to full life, to full humanity. Whenever human beings become what they were meant to be, when even death cannot finally hold its prisoners, then we can truly speak of power. I, I don't know about you. I think that's a powerful quote in and of itself. Um, you were, I was entrusted with power to, to bless and to be a blessing. You are an ambassador of God's shalom. You're called by a cruciform God to cruciform love for the sake of a hurting world. That's the good news. But sin Sin always turns the good news on its head. So spiritual abuse is about the misuse of power and authority. It's about a grasping power. We see first in Genesis chapter 3 versus the non-grasping, non-exploitative power of Jesus sung about in the Christ hymn in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, this is what Paul said. This is a familiar passage. 
So just listen to it again. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. I, I like that translation because I hear a little bit of Genesis 3 in that. Adam and Eve grasped, and we've been grasping ever since. But there are other translations. He did not consider equality with God something to be exploited or taken advantage of. See, spiritual abuse is the misuse and abuse of power, which harms the flock, but also exploits God and the things of God. So what we hear here is that we turn adoration of God into exploitation of God. We take advantage of God's people. We, we turn God and God's people into resources for us to meet our needs. And, and this is inherently narcissistic. We turn people into mirrors to reflect back our personal glory to us. One, one writer calls the narcissist mirror hungry. In other words, you must reflect back to me what I need, whatever that is, validation, approval, acceptance, specialness, rightness, empowerment. And if you don't, well, watch out because you're going to experience my unique anger as one who blames you for not meeting my needs. And so um, this is a dangerous place to be. Uh, if you'd sit in my chair, you'd see it almost every day. And you'd see it in well-trained veteran shepherds. You'd see it in well-respected authors. You'd see it in some of the venerated stars of Christendom. And it's pain, a painful sight to see someone so powerful who, in his deep sense of insecurity, takes advantage of the sheep. And so we need to hone in just a little bit more now. Let's just talk about what spiritual abuse is and the manifestations of it. And we begin with a definition by Oakley and Humphreys and their really helpful book. By the way, I'll offer you some resources at the end, but this is a really helpful book called Escaping the Maze of Spiritual Abuse, where they write, spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse characterized by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior in a religious context. Let's walk through that for just a moment. First of all, it's emotional and psychological abuse, which by definition, and hear this, by definition, is it, this is abuse without bruises. Uh, there isn't a physical imprint, so to speak, but there's no less emotional trauma. Um, I often say that I've been testifying in courts for over 20 years now, I think, and uh Things haven't changed. In fact, I talked to someone who was in court two weeks ago and judges and lawyers are still saying, what is emotional abuse? What is psychological abuse? Where are her bruises? Where are her wounds? And so it's a pattern of emotional and psychological abuse, which is often invisible. Now we'll talk a little bit, in a little bit about the manifestations of it and the impact of trauma. Um, but on the surface, you can't really see it. Second piece here is that it's a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior. And I want you to hear this really clearly. It's a pattern because we all lose our temper. Uh, just a moment ago, Todd was asking, is there a spectrum? Yeah, we all lose our temper, right? There are one-off moments where we wield our power to hurt another. But my sense is that a humble and self-aware soul is aware pretty quickly of what she's done. And there's a movement to empathy. There's a movement to repair. There's a movement to repentance. And so pattern is a really important word because what we see in abusive systems and among abusive leaders is, is um, a willingness sometimes to apologize for one-off occurrence as they call them. But you'll actually see a pattern over time if you look a little bit more carefully. You'll see it across the years in current staff members and former staff members. You'll, you'll see it if you interview people from previous or former congregations. And I'll, I'll emphasize this. What we often find is someone who's willing to say, yeah, yeah, I've, I have an occasional problem with control, 
but someone who's quite resistant to seeing and owning a pattern of sin. And what's also troubling here is that the very systems around this leader ordinarily conspire to allow this to happen so that if you remove the abusive leader and you don't uh, you don't tackle the systems, you don't address the systems and structures that enabled his abuse, you're just punting the ball away and failing to protect the flock. So I think Oakley and Humphreys have a really helpful definition. Here's another definition by Rachel Chen. Rachel works with Dan Allender at the Allender Center. She says spiritual abuse is the use of religion or spiritual power and authority to control, coerce, or perpetrate harm. It's a distortion or exploitation of God's power and authority. Those in authority manipulate and control bodies, personhood, relationships, and autonomy. It's a use, again, of religion or spiritual power and authority. We've talked about that. We've talked a little bit about the exploitation of God's power. But what I think is helpful here is that there's this implication on bodies, personhood, relationships, and autonomy. In a moment, I'll talk about the trauma of abuse. And we see that it, this isn't simply a, a, a blemish, um, a small wound, but this has a, a deep and really personal comprehensive impact on people and on bodies. So let's talk about the manifestations of spiritual abuse. Uh, and we've got 11 here, just 11 ways that we often see spiritual abuse unfolding in congregations and systems and among leaders. Uh, manipulation and exploitation. One is used or taken advantage of, like we just talked about a moment ago. Enforced accountability. Uh, you got to note that there's often high accountability for those who are used or taken advantage of, but very low or no accountability for those in power. Um, there are often loyalty tests or oaths that people have to take, which require people to abandon any sense of conviction or intuition of what's right or wrong. Uh, in, in some work that I did maybe about 10 years ago, there was an executive assistant to a lead pastor who kept a, a file of secrets, drunk driving, uh, pornography use. Um, she's mortified that she did it, but there was a kind of loyalty test. You can work for me if you keep my secrets. There are restrictions or censorship on decision making, which in turn strips others of their autonomy. Um, one worship director said to me a number of years ago, I had the authority to lead until the lead pastor come, came along and unilaterally decided to switch things in the worship service at the last minute without any empathy for those impacted. There are requirements for secrecy and silence, which can become a characteristic of a culture over time. To speak out is a form of betrayal. And this is often... Um, uh, there's often a kind of collusion with larger systems that help these uh, lead pastors uh, keep the system silent. There is a coercion to conform. So in other words, survivors of spiritual abuse will often say that they lost their way. They lost themselves. I get this question all the time. Why did you stay so long with that narcissistic leader, with that abusive pastor? But there's this kind of Stockholm syndrome of the soul that happens is you lose touch with your sense of autonomy and agency, will, needs, desires. What we see in systems like this at times is a control through the use of sacred texts or teaching. Uh, and this is exactly what we see in scripture in Genesis 3 and Matthew 4. Scripture is twisted for self-serving purposes. And th this is what's tricky because people see us as authorities. They see us with our collars on, with our robes on. They trust us implicitly because of our roles. And this is why, uh, in, in some ways, spiritual abuse is even more insidious, uh, a more insidious form of psychological abuse or emotional abuse. Um, there are requirements of, of obedience to the abuser. And when you cross that invisible line, you may not even know it. There's a suggestion that the abuser has a divine position. You see this often. You've seen this in the sexual abuse scandals in the Catholic Church and beyond, that sense that you can't question someone who has been ordained by God. Um, there's isolation as a means of punishment. Spiritual abusers will rally other staff to isolate and marginalize someone within the system. This is sort of a contemporary form of shunning. 
And then finally, and this may be obvious, there's a kind of superiority and elitism oftentimes that you find as a manifestation of spiritual abuse. Uh, one of the classic mar marks of a narcissistic abuser is his sense of grandiosity. And in this grandiosity and superi superiority and elitism, um, there's this desire to maintain it at all costs. I think for the sake of the fragile ego, which lurks underneath uh, the, the abuser's psyche. And so with all these manifestations, what we find is, uh, well, this is a, a newly coined term a little over a decade ago. What we find is what is now being called religious trauma syndrome. Religious trauma syndrome. And there are four aspects to religious trauma syndrome. These are really important to keep in mind because you'll, you'll notice these one or two or three of these um, pop up here or there. And those just may be initial cues at something larger going on. There are cognitive cues, emotional cues, functional or bodily cues, social or cultural cues. Under the cognitive, you th see things like either or thinking, poor critical thinking, scapegoating, dissociation. The reality of, of, of cognitive, the cognitive impact is that someone impacted by spiritual abuse has become disconnected from his or her own uh, own deep intuitions. Um, they were probably susceptible to abuse, perhaps because they were previously abused. Um, and so they're susceptible to a powerful or authoritarian person uh, who tells her who she is, what she should believe, how she should act. Uh, you see from this that there can be confusion. There can be kind of either or, or all or nothing thinking. Uh, in other words, either this this leader is the best, omnipotent, he's the best pastor I've ever had, or I'm leaving the church and the church can't be trusted. There are even more significant traumatic impacts like dissociation, where there's the sense of disconnection from reality. And it's important with this not to respond to people who've been abused and who manifest these kinds of cognitive symptoms with the right answers, with some sort of new indoctrination, but with empathy and a desire to help her find her own sense of agency, to make sense of what has happened to her, um, for her to find her own authentic connection to God apart from this powerful mediator in her life. There are the emotional impacts. Some of you may be familiar with this iceberg model of human emotions. Um, while someone may seem to be coping okay above the waterline, there's often massive pain lurking underneath. Uh, and so the question is, what happens to one's soul when it's been preyed upon, used as a resource, exploited for the sake of a shepherd's ego? Well, he's left with massive questions. Who am I? What did I do to deserve this? Why am I so unlovable? She feels a, a deep sense of shame, anger, powerlessness, maybe a, a, even a sense of a loss of a will to live. Uh, perhaps she so plugged her identity into this pastor or this church system that she doesn't even know how to live life apart from it. And so you see all kinds of emotional manifestations, anger, rage, sadness, guilt, suicidal ideation, panic, loss of pleasure. And then you see another, you see another symptom or a set of symptoms that arise. Oftentimes, I'd say that these are some of the first that we'll see, sleeplessness, digestive issues, headaches, substance abuse, eating disorders. Some of you know the work of Bessel van der Kolk who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, you may ask someone, how are you doing? And they'll say to you, I'm, I'm fine, everything's great. But then you hear from them about the IBS issues. Uh, you hear about uh, the sleeplessness or the headaches. And, and you say to them, I, I don't think you're fine at all. I think we need I think we need to get you some care. People who are not even aware that they're impacted by spiritual abuse may begin with these more functional or bodily symptoms. May, they may go to their medical doctor for headaches. Um, they, they, may, they may begin to abuse substances. There may be this loss of appetite. Um, but if you hone in and pay attention, you may begin to see that this is due in part to the trauma of spiritual abuse. Then finally, there are these social or cultural symptoms of religious trauma. In other words, you find yourself on the outs from a leader. Uh, you find yourself in a community where you've invested your entire sense of identity. Maybe you were a staff member 
um, and, and now you've been fired, but you still live in the community. And there's this massive impact on you, the cognitive, the emotional, functional and bodily. But now when you go to the grocery store, you fear running into someone from the church, someone on staff. Uh, you wonder about the narrative they're, they're telling about you. And because of the trauma, the trauma, your body is still in a kind of survival mode. You're hyper vigilant, you're hyper alert, which is exhausting. And so that leads to more social isolation and sometimes even more drastic action. And so it's really important when we talk about the manifestations of spiritual abuse, the symptoms in terms of trauma to pay attention. You're not going to see all of these uh, manifesting in the same person, but there may be a bit of either or thinking, depression, digestive issues, a lack of belonging. Um, and as we begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together, begin to realize that, yeah, she's dealing with some very real impact from trauma that needs to be acknowledged. Now, I want to take a, uh, a kind of a turn of the corner here, spend a few minutes talking about systems, and then we'll finish up talking about healthy cultures, okay? When we talk about systems, I've been impacted by the work of Peter Sange. I think his, um, I think he describes very helpfully uh, what we see just in terms of the above, above the waterline, as we talked about a moment ago, the above the waterline events that happen and the below the waterline implications. When we talk about this, it's important to say at the outset that when we attend to systems, uh, more often than not, what we will hear reported at first are the events. This happened in this particular church last Sunday. What are we going to do about it? And that's good. That's helpful. Uh, we need to attend to that event. Uh, when I go in as a consultant, I want to go in listening very carefully to what happened. Um, I have, uh, I'm trained in qualitative research, so I'm trained to carefully listen to stories and take copious notes. So I want to go in. I want to listen to what happened. I want people to be honest, to tell me what they heard. I need them to be detailed and specific about what happened. And I need them to name and assess very specifically the hurt or the damage. But there are some potential challenges to reducing the work to the above the waterline events that happen, the spiritually abusive events that happen. And you see that at the bottom of the slide, the potential challenges reducing the problem to a one-time event. Well, that just happened. You know, these, these, these things happen in churches. Um, uh, well, maybe it was a one-time event, but maybe we need to look a bit more carefully at, uh, at what else is going on there. At times, there is this danger of scapegoating a person or a policy. So in other words, if we reduce it down to event, an event, and uh, we blame that event on the executive pastor and we fire the executive pastor. We think, well, we're done with it now. That, that's it. That took care of the problem and we're good to go. And that's not always the case. We change the policy. It's not always the case. It's not always helpful. And so there's a danger of stopping at the level of events. So we need to go beneath the waterline. And as we step beneath the waterline, we begin to see that there are patterns. If we listen carefully, listen to people's stories. If we expand our view, as I say, when I go in, I begin to, I begin to interview people. I do this kind of qualitative in interviewing. I ask them to tell their stories. As we do this interviewing, we begin to track themes. Themes may begin to pop up here and there. There's a pattern of bullying. Um, there's a pattern of condescension. And these themes look different in every system. This is why it's impossible to, to give you a kind of objective universal guidebook to dealing with this in every setting, because as we go in and as we listen very carefully, what you'll find is that in this local setting and this local parish, these patterns are what emerged. And as we listen carefully and as we listen to the patterns and we interview people, we might, we might begin to create a narrative timeline. Well, a number of the folks say that this goes back 10 years. Well, the lead pastor has only been here for five years. So maybe there's something inherent within the system that we need to look at. So we begin to clearly name roles and abuses within the system. And what I want to say by way of potential challenges is that this is where people start to get nervous. <laughs> people like me come in and say, hey, it's time to have a conversation and we need to go beneath the waterline 
there's this institutional hesitancy to expand the scope. Can't, can't we just deal with what just happened? Can't we just fire that abusive pastor? Um, there's some hesitancy because there's a tendency toward pragmatism and individualism to solve or eliminate problems. What's the easiest way through this? Um, it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's expensive to engage in these larger conversations. And at times there's fear among staff who would speak out. In other words, I, you know, I'll say something about what just happened uh, with that executive pastor who said that thing in the staff meeting and really hurt us. But for me to begin to name the things that have been happening over the course of the last 10 years, well, that's a bit more risky and I may, I may lose my job in the process. So you can see how as we go beneath what he calls the line of invisibility down through that, uh, it, it gets a little bit more nerve wracking. Um, we, we keep going down and now we need to begin to tend to and name how structures and systems are implicated. Now, of course, there are the explicit policies. There are the explicit, um, uh, there's a polity and policies that perhaps enabled the abuse. That, that, at one level, that's, that, that, would be, uh, that would be one thing for us to look at. Um, what, are, uh, what are the policies? What is the polity? Um, how are we governed? I think what's more important at times are the implicit policies or biases, the unwritten rules and expectations within a system. When I go and I do this kind of interviewing, I'll say, well, you know, your, your polity says this, um, or your laws of governance say this, but what do you experience? What are, the, what are the real rules within the system? How do you really operate? And when you begin to hear from folks on this, you realize, oh, there are a whole other set of expectations, much as you have in families, right? Our families of origin, there are these unwritten rules um, that we're, we're not to, supposed to speak, or we're not supposed to push back, or we're never allowed to have conflict, whatever they might be, when we begin to push down below this line of invisibility and do the deeper work, what we realize is there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. And so we need, we need to honestly name failures of system and accountability. And as I'll talk about in a moment, uh, we eventually get to a kind of reimagination process, which doesn't eliminate these systems, doesn't eliminate the structures, polity, policies, things like that, but we get to reimagine um, all over again. What are some of the potential challenges here? Well, reducing a problem to a policy change. Well, I guess that was a bad policy. We'll create a new policy. You know how that goes. Sounds really simple. Um, or seeing explicit uh, rules or policies, but ignoring the invisible rules, as I just talked about a moment ago. Um, and so, yeah, of course, that could be written a little bit differently. But no, 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 Chuck, you're making too big of a deal up about these invisible rules within the system. There's, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing implicit or invisible that we need to look at. Or finally, thinking policies alone can protect us. This is where folks who are really good at writing policy and wordsmithing will say, I'll take a shot at writing the policy that safeguards us against all future abuse. And I want to say thank you for your heart but that alone won't uh, be in and of itself helpful. So then we go down a step further to mental models. These are hard conversations, but I, I wanna say really fun conversations too. Um, this is our opportunity to interrogate beliefs and values around power, authority. In other words, imagine having an open-ended conversation where we talk about as a staff, uh, as an elder board, as a vestry, how do we understand power, authority, control? Um, what does equity mean in our system? Personhood, participation, progress, growth, gender, race. These are different in different kinds of systems. What's helpful is to bring to the surface and reimagine in honest and explicit ways what's valued. How, how have we operated? What, what, how have we understood power within the system? How have we understood gender within the system? What do we need to talk about here? Um, I, I know that as I did this work within a particularly progressive church, that uh, at least on paper, check the boxes of we are egalitarian, we are open and affirming. What we discovered was that a female pastor who was elevated to be a co-pastor, who was supposed to preach equally equally, 
with the lead male senior pastor. Well, what we began to realize was even though we check certain theological boxes, as the women within the system told me, um, this is um, an old boys club. <laughs> on paper, we check certain theological boxes. Yes, we're egalitarian. Yes, we're progressive on sexuality. But in reality, um, there is no place for me to have any kind of power or influence within this system. So again, just because you've got certain polity, just because you check certain theological boxes does not necessarily mean that, uh, that, that the culture follows. And so we get to ask ourselves, and this is where these conversations are both hard but also helpful, what does flourishing look like? Um, what is the true, the good, the beautiful for us? Um, what policies and structures would follow if we began to live out of our deep values, um, our deep values, our, our biblical values, um, cruciform values, gospel values for the kind of people we wanna be? What patterns would people anticipate now that we're living out of these deeper gospel-centered values? In other words, in the past, patterns were patterns of bullying or coercion, but now we might see patterns of self-giving love, of generosity, of hospitality. And how would people feel? Finally, repentance and repair. My, my deep sense is that it's by doing this work, this deeper work, that we get to real repentance and repair. If you, if you, merely consider repentance as a kind of above the waterline repentance, you will only be repenting of a one-off event. So I say an honest assessment necessarily leads people and systems to deep grief, profound regret, regret and repentance and real efforts toward repair. Just, just like we cannot reduce the process down to an event, so repentance and repair isn't a one-time effort. I worked with a church where after doing a bit of this work, a couple of people had gotten together on a phone call after one of our meetings, and they said, we've written a congregational letter, and we think this will solve the problem. I, I'm grateful for your intentions, but I don't think it's going to solve the problem. And I think real repentance uh, moves from intention to impact. In other words, I, I understand that people want to say, well, I didn't intend to do that. We didn't intend um, to have that to, to have that happen at our church. Um, but what we need to focus on is how were people impact? How are people hurt in the process? My sense is that when we do this, honest grief, honest repentance fuels an imagination for the beautiful community. We begin to long in new ways for a different way of being, a different way of being together, a different way of being staff and vestry, a different way of uh, being in relationship and being church um, and being in mission with one another as well. So let me end with this. Let's talk a little bit about creating healthy cultures within the church. And we could spend another hour on this. I'll give you five, I think, five helpful, um, perhaps, um, conversation starters. And by the way, I sent, I sent a handout um, to Eric. And so I, I'm hoping that you all will get this handout that I have uh, that will allow you to to take the conversation back to your staff and vestries and, and to continue it. Um, number one, transforming a church culture takes time. We don't like this. We like it to be easy and pragmatic, but it's a death to resurrection process. Uh, when I preside at the table, I say Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Um, is that merely a theological or sacramental reality or can we allow that to be characteristic of how we change personally and how we change organizationally? And this requires empathy, and truth, patience, perseverance. There's no meaningful change, at least not change that I've seen, uh, without a sense of loss and grief and courage to make significant change. Number two, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution because patterns and structures and mental models differ. And so you've got to ask yourself, what are the unique manifestations of spiritual abuse in my context? What are the unique impacts, cognitive, emotional, societal? What are the particular patterns involved here in our church? What are the structures that, it, that are implicated? What are the mental models at work here? So this is not merely about reading a book and applying principles sort of in a universal way. It's about doing this sort of ground up work from within. Third, 
In healthy cultures, leaders do their inner work. I've never come across a healthy system with a leader who isn't self-aware. Um, and, and I always say self-knowledge, self-awareness is not some modern therapeutic invention. Um, Augustine begins the first nine chapters of his confessions telling his story. He begins chapter 10 with Noverum, me, Noverum, te, let me know myself, let me know you, O Lord. John Calvin begins the Institutes with his doctrine of self-knowledge. Richard Baxter begins the Reformed pastor talking about a lack of humility among, among pastors and inviting them to deeper humility and repentance. Uh, a, a lesser known tome of Richard Baxter is a book, a 300 page tome called On the Mischiefs of Self-Ignorance and the Benefits of Self-Acquaintance. Um, my, my favorite 16th century reformer, St. Teresa of Avila, um, uh, talks about self-knowledge and humility as organically interrelated. There is not self-knowledge without humility. As one knows oneself, you necessarily become a more humble person. And so when I talk about inner work, when I talk about self-awareness, inner work isn't simply sitting with a therapist complaining about the flock. You know, oh God, I've got such a uh, I've got such a mean group of people in my church. I, I get that. I understand that. But good therapy, good inner work leads to self-responsibility. What happens in me when I'm triggered? What do I do with my anger, my disappointment, my shame? How are these responses anchored in my story? And how am I being, being invited to grow up and mature in Christ? And then how does that change how I show up in relationships? How I show up in systems? And so leaders do their inner work. Number four, while toxic cultures are inherently anxious systems, healthy cultures value safety, safeguard against abuse, and take trauma seriously. Safety. Uh, what safety isn't? <laughs> safety isn't conflict avoidant. Safety isn't afraid of hard conversations. Rather, a good leader, good structures create the environment where people can speak boldly, where people can take risks, and even fail at times where people can offer and be offered feedback without fear of retaliation, without fear of being ostracized or crossing some invisible line that will upset the leader. This is what I see. I see toxic leaders and toxic systems have this pretense of toughness and truth telling, many of them with this kind of hyper masculine feel, but they're predicated on fear. My sense is that a truly strong leader creates a space where ideas are free flowing, where feedback is freely given, where following the leader isn't compelled by fear or threat, but it's motivated by respect and freedom and shared mission. Uh, also, these are, these are church systems that are safeguarded against abuse and they're trauma informed. Um, if these are new concepts to you, if, if safeguarding trauma informed church, if those are new to you. Navigate after this time together today to netgrace.org, an organization called Grace, Godly Response to Abuse in Christian Environments. Uh, it's a, uh, a really wonderful safeguarding agency with resources and curriculum and, and more. You find all sorts of goodness there. And finally, healthy cultures are born out of intentional, highlight the word intentional processes of evaluating and reevaluating uh, evaluating mental models, implicit beliefs and biases, imagining, reimagining structures that promote what is just and good, and creating and recreating patterns of wholeness and health where people thrive and mission flourishes. I, I want to say health and wholeness is not anti-mission. Remember back in college, I, I started studying Leslie Newbegin. Um, David Bosch. I helped co-found an organization called the Newbegin House of Studies. I've been involved in church planting for 20 years, um, and I've been involved in clergy health and wholeness for 20 years. And, and where we see whole and holy people, we see flourishing mission. Um, there are these unfortunate dichotomies between the inward, the outward, the therapeutic, and the missional contemplation and action. And I think if there's a chasm, it's, it's a modern invention. And it's largely unhelpful. Um, there's a, a fairly new book by Rich Viotis called The Deeply Formed Life. Rich does a really good job of kind of blowing up this, this chasm, this unfortunate dichotomy 
and painting a, a different kind of picture. And then finally, I know you've listened to me for long enough, but I think we'll have some time for some conversation. Final slide, uh, beyond a slide with some resources, cruciform power to bless and to bring life. Remember Andy Crouch, he said, life is power, power is life. Flourishing power, it leads to flourishing life. Of course, like life itself, power is nothing, worse than nothing without love. Um, what does love then demand for such a time as this? Let me give you a few C's. Cruciform power is courageous. Courageous from the Latin root core, to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. As I see it, abuse of power is fundamentally self-protective and exploitative based in fear. So will we live courageously? And cruciform power is compassionate. For those of you, probably all of you who at one point or another studied Greek, there's that wonderful word, splag chisno, chisnomai, move to one's core uh, or one's bowels, right? The bowels in the ancient world were the seed of love and empathy. Um, uh, to be moved to one's bowels is to let someone else impact you, to be vulnerable. And I, I sometimes, and I, I know they mean well, but I sometimes hear uh, leaders say, well, you've got to develop a thick skin, or which I, I kind of hear through the lens of you've got to harden your heart. But a hard heart is a heart that can't be moved. And I, I want to ask the question, how can we remain vulnerable? I know there's pain in ministry, but how can we remain vulnerable, empathetic, compassionate ministers for compassionate ministry? Courage, compassion. Third, curiosity. A question that I learned back in 1997 from... Uh, my counseling professor, Gary Rupp in seminary, how do you experience me? The very first time I asked this question was in seminary among a group of women, and I expected their answers to be, you're the best, Chuck. I mean, you're just so smart and courageous and helpful and thoughtful. And, and what I heard is, Chuck, we don't like being around you. You're arrogant. You're a know-it-all. You don't realize your impact. How do you experience me? I think it takes courage, by the way, to ask this question of curiosity. And this has become a guiding question for me wherever I've served, in Orlando and San Francisco and various leader, leadership positions. People always have the freedom. My students now have the freedom to come to me and answer that question. I had a student answer that question for me a few years ago. He said, Chuck, you talk so much about presence and connection. And yet when you walk through the seminary, you're walking 60 miles an hour, and I try to get your attention. I can't get it. So if you want me to answer the question, how do you experience me? I would say I experience you as distant and disconnected. It was a hard conversation to have, but a really important one for me. Cruciform power next is comprehensive. It always asks the question, how far does this go, and what does repair look like? Because my, my default is to say, yeah, yeah, there was just that one thing that I did, right? Just that one thing, but, I, but I've got to be curious enough to ask, how, how far did it go? How far back does it go? We've got to be able to ask this in systems. We've got to have the courage to be able to ask, well, how far does it go? Who's implicated in it? What are the patterns that we need to look at? What are the questions we need to ask? And for that reason, I end with cruciform power is costly because my default um, I'm sure this isn't the case for all of you, but my default is to protect my power, protect my ego, protect my reputation. I think the gospel calls me to risking losing it all for the sake of love, justice, human flourishing. Jesus begins the Beatitudes with blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, the word patokas, blessed are you when you come to the end of yourselves. And I think there's a sense in which when we engage this conversation my self-protective instincts go way up. I become really defensive. But how might I be invited to come to the very end of myself to participate in a death to re resurrection process um, for a church that manifests the cruciform, courageous, compassionate love of Jesus? And so, um, so final slide, just some resources that I found helpful. Friends, I hope you found this helpful, um, these last few minutes together. I'm, I consider it a privilege to be invited into these kinds of conversations. I'm really grateful. I'm going to pause now. I'm, 
thinking maybe Todd will jump in and we'll see if we have some time for some conversation. Thank you very much, Chuck. That's um, exactly what I was looking for. And just to give people a couple of seconds to uh, think about questions, rather than using the chat room, um, I think we'll do it verbally um, by you know, using that feature of raising your hand. And then if one of you can remind me, <laughs> I don't lead these meetings that often. I mean, when I'm in control of the computer, I forget, how do I see whose hands up? Is that under participants, Eric? or whoever. Yeah, that, that's correct. If you have the participant tab open, you'll be able to see it. Okay. All right. Um, so I know this is, uh, you know, this big stuff, um, um, you know, maybe even uh, heavy stuff, um, but it's, uh, it's just super important um, for us to talk about. So uh, who has a question for Chuck? Just do that hands up thing and... Uh, so, so if I click on participants, I'm not seeing that there, Eric. It should be at the bottom next to the chat. Yeah, but if I click on it, I'm not seeing the, oh, usually okay. I've seen that panel open up before. Is it reactions? Um, Connor Hansen has a question. Okay, Connor, go ahead. Hey Chuck, thanks for taking the time to do this. Yeah, um, Connor. I'm curious about how this applies into an Anglican context and I guess I'm going to try to formulate this question here. It's still kind of rattling around. Um, I can see how some in an Anglican ecclesial context or with an Anglican polity would want to slow this process down because it seems to threaten their understanding of ecclesial authority or their particular understanding of, it feels like it usurps this sense of how the church should run because yeah. we're Anglicans. Yeah. I guess I would just, I'd be curious about your thoughts into, into that. Yeah, it does. I think it. I, I think this conversation is harder sometimes for us. Uh, you know, I, I'm a I'm a minister of Word and Sacrament in the oldest denomination in the United States, the Reformed Church in America. And for that reason, we think we've crossed all of our T's and dotted our I's. And so there is a sense in which we, uh, when we engage this kind of conversation, get a little anxious about it. Like, hey, I, th I think we've figured this out. I think we've got accountability, good ecclesiology, strong polity. And, and the reality is, is even with those things, what I find over and over again is that uh, they're sidestep for the sake of protecting particular leaders or avoiding hard conversations. Uh, and so we simply need to be honest when we see this happening. And um, well, we have the privilege of, of, of good, uh, good ecclesiology, good thinking around these things. It doesn't immunize us to the hard questions, I'd say. Uh, Connor, did that get to your question? It did. Thank you. That was helpful. You're welcome. Uh, I'll Matt, also say that oh, I uh, sorry. Go ahead, Chuck. I just I posted um, a handout for all of you that includes those resources on the last slide. If you're wondering, right. you're you know trying to scratch those down on on a sheet of paper. They're all on that resource that I just uh, attached in the chat, along with some questions that if you've got a staff, you might want to kind of return to your staff and have a conversation with them. Great. Okay, that's Thanks, it. Chuck. Yep. Uh, Matthew Brown. Yeah, hi, uh, Chuck. I, I was wondering as I was listening to um, you describe this, like, are there any, have you seen any successful ways of, of even like surveying a church, like getting a sense of what the people's experience is? You know, I guess I feel like this could be a thing where people are unwittingly having an, um, uh, an impact that they, are, they aren't aware of. And yeah. So how, you know, I, we have like whistleblower policies and things like that, but on the yeah. sort of the more subtle, you know, bruiseless uh, emotional things, have you seen any, any successful pipelines for getting this kind of feedback? It, yeah, getting this kind of feedback. Yeah, I mean, I would take a look at Oakley's and, um, and Humphrey's book and some of their research, because I think that you'll find there some surveys that have been used that are helpful. Um, surveys can get at that at times if you have the right questions and if you're really willing to hear. I think um, uh, on the other side of, of things, those of us who, who like to do more qualitative interviewing, you know, that allows for kind of richer and thicker and more specific data. Um, if people are willing um, to have, you know, a consultant come in and ask good questions, you might find that that can be helpful too. And there's, there are a number of different things in between as well. So I'd say, um, 
The answer is yes, there are resources. Um, check out uh, the Oakley and Humphreys book, but there are a host of other ones too. And, and for me, it's the willingness to engage it, whether you use a survey, do some interviewing, bring someone in, it's the courage to, uh, to engage the conversation that's most important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dean. Awesome, thank you, Chuck. Uh, this is very helpful. I'm wondering also about uh, resources that you might be aware of that would help um, people who are past victims of spiritual abuse. I think the Anglican church, in my experience, tends to draw in some sense, people who are looking for a more stabilizing spiritual experience. And so I've found a lot of those people in my ministry. I'm wondering about what resources you might know of that would help um, help people kind of heal and move forward after that kind of uh, experience? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there, I think that some of the resources that you saw there are helpful just to kind of uh, for, for people to read them and say, okay, so it's, it's not only me or not crazy, you know, so that's in and of itself, that's helpful. But I, I don't think there's any replacement for a good spiritual director, a good therapist who can actually get into the the experience of trauma, um, the individual experience of trauma, and draw that out and do the healing work. Um, there are survivor forums. You know, I, I I've got mixed feelings about those things because they can be um, they can be places where people just kind of jump in and kind of complain about what they experience, but they 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 don't heal. Um, and so I think if you can get with with someone with some expertise. Uh, trauma-informed therapist who understands these kinds of dynamics mm. and do that work, and I and and I would say someone who isn't sort of like anti-church either, but but want, they want to help you process this in a way that allows you to take seriously what happened, and and move to to a place, if possible, a place of restoration and reconciliation. Great, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Matt Tebby. Oh no. Chuck D. Good to see you again, brother. Good to see you too. Uh, I take podcast? the podcast. Uh, <laughs> I take the oh no as being a great groan of delight that we get to see each other. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, um, hey, I, I have a question. I'm going to try to ask it quickly. Um, yeah. uh, we are in this crazy season where it feels like we know how to get abuse wrong, uh, meaning identifying and handling it. Um, I, um, a, a pastor, um, a well-known pastor said on Twitter this week, I don't know a single pastor friend of mine or priest friend of mine who hasn't been accused of leadership abuse. Yeah. And the subtext was, um, we can't take these things seriously or else there'll be no pastors left. Um, yeah. I don't know. If, so, so there, there's kind of, and then there's the war on empathy and like, we, we cannot give, we cannot take these these people saying abuse credibly because yeah. they're just trying to tear good men down. Yeah. Then, then you've got other voices. I'm thinking of Amy Marie Brown, We Will Not Cancel Us. I don't know if you've read that book, but she talks about how in the abolitionist movement with Black women, there's a lot of marginalized, traumatized people who don't know how to handle conflict because every conflict they have in their group, they hurl accusations of abuse at each other. Mm because they've been traumatized. Yeah. I mean, Reed Brown is basically saying we have to learn how to delineate between mistakes, conflict, yeah. uh, disagreements, yeah. and what is abuse. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question for you is, Chuck, like, I think all of us don't, we don't want to be abusive leaders. Mm -hmm. And we want to walk faithfully through allegations of abuse. Mm -hmm. But it seems like none of us know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what are some handholds for you yeah. that you can give us so that we can become more faithful in this? Yeah, that's a really good question. I was having a conversation with a good friend yesterday where I said, you know, I wrote this book on narcissism in the church. And then I, you know, th then, then the problem is I tried to nuance it. And if you read the book, I really tried to nuance the conversation, but then you end up having folks that see a narcissist under every rock or bush, right? And, and so that's, that's the problem, that's the danger. At the same time, we're in the infancy of this conversation. I mean, we're literally in the infancy of, of understanding what it means to be trauma-informed, let alone we're just beginning 
to understand what it means to safeguard our congregations and become trauma-informed as pastors. And so you all are having this conversation in October of, of 2021, right? I, I did a mental health counseling program in the mid 1990s, and we didn't talk about trauma. And so we're at the very beginnings of this conversation, and it's gonna it's gonna be wild. <laughs> you know, there are gonna be false allegations in the midst of this, and at the same time, we're gonna have to take these allegations with a kind of brutal seriousness and forge processes. Um, I I. You know, with the presentation today, I tried to give a general picture of what that looks like, right, even in terms of systems. But when I say we're in the infancy, um, we're just figuring this out right now. I hope in 10 or 15, 20 years from now, Matt, there's a sense of, oh, this is what we do when there's an allegation. And, and why wouldn't we do that? This is, a, But it's not, there's no muscle memory around this right now. And so, of course, there are people out there, whether it's on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other places like, hey, whoa, 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 wait a second, look at me. My story isn't being seen. I know there are people making false allegations, but this really happened, you know? And so it's so, I, I hear your question. It's really complicated. Um, my bent is to take the allegation, allegations seriously every time, and then to do the work of listening really carefully, right? Um, and, and that just, it takes time, it takes money, investment. I've been a consultant. It's wearying for me. It's wearying for the church to do this work, but we've, we've got to do it to take it seriously. The last thing I'll say is that I, I think Langham is right. I mentioned earlier that if we continue to do things like this and understand what spiritual abuse is, if we're aware of the power we have in the room, um, I, I think that then we'll begin to show up differently as pastors. Um, but I realized for me, I'm a, I'm a 51 year old white male. And so I'm relearning things that have been patterns in my body for 20 or 30 years. And that takes some intentional work, right? So it's, it requires some courage for all of us. I don't know if I, if, if, if I hit the target of your question, but thanks for it. All right, I think we have time for three more questions. So I've got uh, Cindy Stansbury, Amanda and Kimberly. So we'll uh, take them in that order, uh, Cynthia. Trying again now, unmuted. Um, you had a great list of um, symptoms of trauma from spiritual mm -hmm. abuse. And I'm just curious, are, which, are those all, which ones of those are true for any form of abuse? Like, are there any of those that are specific to spiritual abuse that we yeah. should keep an eye out for? Here's the thing about abuse is, um, or let's just say, here's the thing about trauma. Um, Trauma um, d doesn't really um, care about how it happened. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is maybe you were ritually abused in a cult. Maybe you were sexually abused by your dad. Maybe you were spiritually abused in a church. Um, you may find the same symptoms in each one of those people. Maybe you're a victim of um, PTSD, uh, having been in a war context, right? And you will find on that list, the same things pop up, right? And so, uh, yeah, the answer is yes, spiritual abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, PTSD, um, uh, cult, cult abuse. We, I never want to compare. And people, people compare. They'll come into me and the first thing they'll say is, I know people have worse stories than me, but dot, 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 right? And I said, no. Tell me your story. I want to hear about your symptoms. And, and guess what? Their symptoms are the same symptoms that I saw in that guy who's coming out of Afghanistan, the same symptoms that I saw with a woman who's a victim of incest. And so trauma is trauma is trauma. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Uh, Amanda? Hi. I'm trying to think how to ask this question. I think it kind of boils down to, I'm thinking about the reimagining process. And I guess my question is, what are maybe the ways to avoid blind spots even in that, in terms of who, who does the reimagining, right? I can imagine, yeah. you know, are there best practices in terms of what that ought to look like, who to get involved, um, so it's not just people who are like me doing it? I mean, that's such a great question. And there are all kinds of landmines when you get to that. Like, you, you, you get, you know, you get the group that wants to actually do the work and reimagine. Um, 
And I, I'm like, yeah, we, I've actually got a group that wants to do the process, but then, then they're all hankering for like, well, who's going to lead the process and who's going to be in the room? And I have more to say than you have to say. And then I'm like, oh, this is not going to go well at all. And so I, I, it's really hard, Amanda, to answer that because there are a thousand landmines along the way. And, and it requires a lot of wisdom to navigate those landmines. Those, those processes aren't easy. And then just like so, so when I do individual counseling with people, there's resistance. Imagine the resistance in a room of eight people, of 12 people, in a diverse context, whatever it might be, right? You're going to get all of people's stuff start to come up, you know, and they all want me to know that they're taking this really, really seriously and they're going to leave, you know, so hard question to answer. And um, it, it's, uh, it, it makes for some exhausting work to do this. Uh, and if you want to follow up, I mean, you can always email me, we follow up a little bit more on that. If you've got a specific context, you want to apply that to, you know, good question. All right, uh, Kimberly Deckel. Hey. Hey, friend. Um, so I think I've heard you share on this I think I've heard you share some stories about this before, Chuck, but I'm just wondering, like, kind of as we're ending too, will you leave us with, like, a story of how you've seen um, churches or leaders, um, like, use some of this and just kind of um, the, yeah, like, hope, right? Like, how it's yeah. affecting them. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, yeah, there are hopeful stories, everyone. You know, there are courageous leaders in congregations who lean into this work. Um, I, I, so I'll just leave you this one story. Uh, did some work. I, I, I was trying to confuse the details a little bit so you can't guess, but work in, let's say, the Chicago suburbs um, in this um, uh, church that had this history as kind of a white flight history um, now in the suburbs. Um, a black intern comes in, is working in this white church, and we are a church committed to diversity, and we are a church committed to women, and we're, you know, all the, all the stuff, and her experience as an intern at this church for the first year is misogyny, racism, spiritual abuse, all the stuff, um, and yet on paper, the vision, mission statement, all the stuff, and, and so when I was brought in, there was some initial resistance, like she's just young, you know, all this stuff, right? She's young, she's immature. Um, uh, you know, all these young pastors, particularly young women, they're too sensitive. Well, they courageously stepped into a larger conversation and I, I painted the picture of what it would look like to go beneath the waterline. And she became one important voice, but that was the event that precipitated the conversation about the patterns and then looking at the invisible rules within the system, which led us to look at the implicit biases and beliefs. And, the, and it really took the lead pastor, the lead pastor to a couple of the others to say, you know, this may cost me my job. This may cost me some credibility, but I'm willing to step into this. If we, if we want to put our money where our mouth is in terms of our commitments to, um, to undoing um, the, the things we want to undo and the death and resurrection process that I talked about. And this courageous young woman, she was probably 28, 29 years old, um, because of her courage to speak up, um, that led to some massive change within that system, probably took about three years. Um, and with that, in fits and starts, as you might imagine, because, because there were always, there, there, were, there were a group of people who left the church, who couldn't believe that this was true. There were people who didn't want to look at the history of white flight, you know, all this stuff, but but like it turned out to be really extraordinary. And, and then larger conversations, not just about, not just repentance individually for this woman, but like we're going back to old staff members who we let go, interns who left and under, you know, like why did they leave? And we're gonna go and repent intentionally in ways that we've not even been asked to repent of, but we're gonna go and, and track them down. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not without hope in this conversation. And, and of course, Kimberly brings us back to hope. So thank you for uh, for ending there. I'm grateful. So Chuck, one last thing, and then Kimberly Filer, if you could close us in prayer. <clears throat> so Chuck, you said that a, a major part of prevention is self-awareness. And um, I, I, you gave me a thought that you know, I have lived intimately in what you might call the modern spiritual uh, formation movement. Right. Um, the Christian therapeutic movement has happened in my generation. Um, 
you know, those are probably the two biggest things. Yet here we are. So what what would you say to an average working clergy person like us on this call? What can we do to develop the kind of self-awareness you're looking for? And I don't mean to say it's not in spiritual direction, it's not in spiritual discipline, yeah. it's not in therapy, but nevertheless, a lot of that's been going on and we still are. Yeah. How, how would you help us there? Yeah, I think because I, in, in some ways it began with um, a kind of uh, individualistic approach mm. to uh, personal transformation that didn't take into account implications within systems. And I, I think now as we do this work, we're, we're beginning to see that we are, um, we are part of larger systems, that our responsibility is larger than doing our own work of going to a therapist and showing up better and doing conflict better. But, but, it, but it requires us to go beneath that waterline. And, and, and so this is, um, this is the, the growing conversation, right? How does personal transformation and leadership lead to systemic congregational transformation uh, one of the books that you'll see on the list uh, by Tricia Taylor and Jim Harrington um, uh, addresses that particular dynamic. Um, but, I, but I think that's it in part, you know, as we take seriously how this, uh, uh, how we see the manifestations of these things in, sim in systems. And it's not just simply me going to that person who I offended and say, I'm really sorry I did that, but asking the larger question, well, how does that exist in a matrix? Right. So I think that's at least part of it, not all yeah. of it, but at least part of it. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Chuck. Well, I know I speak for everybody, Chuck. Thank you. A very, very hearty, hearty. Uh, thank you. This is big stuff that we're yeah. we're we're committed to um, dealing with here. So, thank you.